but welcome on and all to the bike racing without mercy training vlog and on the agenda today is a 12 minute test more of that in just a second i've been reading tom danielson's book cycling on form and there's a hell of a lot that resonates with me more of that in future vlogs but today's test relates to the use of power to respond to any given situation be it a group rider race or the terrain he advocates being acutely aware sorry just getting up to speed of the power you're using he, he advocates 11 different power zones and each of those zones use different energy systems ranging from predominantly body fat for a combination of body fat and glycogen right away through glycogen and ATP and he discusses the need to be very mindful about your cycling technique, your pedaling technique, your position, the power you're using and the energy systems you're using in order to preserve precious glycogen stores to use it when you need it most. Now as I say, he talks about 11 different power zones and in order to set those power zones he prescribes a 12 minute test riding at a consistent power as much as you can sustain for 12 minutes. Hence I've got ERG on. And the power you sustain for the final four minutes determines all 11 of the zones. So I've set 315 watts. We'll see if I can sustain that for 12 minutes. I'll report back. Just over four minutes to go. This is very much a best effort over 12 minutes, but it needs to be pretty consistent. Tom is clear that if you want the test to derive a fulsome but appropriate 11 power training zones, then don't game the test by going too easy in the first half and then monstering the final four minutes. Tom also elucidates in his book that it's better to be training and riding slightly within yourself in order to build ultimately superior fitness. So with the need for control emblazoned firmly at the front of my mind, I decided to use erg mode to police an in the saddle effort. And based on recent experience, I reckoned that in the saddle, 315 watts would be a solid target to aim for. So I created a little custom training in Zwift and depressed the erg mode switch. Now I'm not a big employer of erg mode. Indeed, under my stewardship, it's pretty much redundant. And I discovered that despite a more than adequate 92 to 95 RPM cadence, I was actually a little bit under the prescribed 315 watts in the first five minutes, averaging 309. And I solved this issue with an extra two to three RPM. I'm not really sure why I'd lose six watts with erg mode engaged and turning the pedals nicely. Answers on the postcard, please. Now with a good warm up in the bank, a nice warm blood hanging on to more of the power delivering oxygen, I felt great throughout this test. And without much intent, or any intent really, the power gradually ramped up above the 315 watts. So I was a bit concerned that the effort would not pass quality control. However, I later reread that provided the power in the final four minutes is not more than 10 watts different from the 12 minute average, Tom is not gonna make you redo your homework. But if the variance is more than 10 watts, a reset is necessary. And having now started to ride more strategically within each of the 11 power zones, I can report that from a practicality mm -hmm. perspective, I concur. You don't want to overestimate your zones, not if you want to make best use of this method. And over a longer ride, based on recent experience, I actually reckon I need to deduct five watts from my own test. That was hard. I think I could probably weight it a bit better. I was a bit hard in the final four minutes and a bit light in the first two or three. But I did have ERG engaged. It just happened. This is how my body responded into that effort. Oh, I'll report back and we'll look at the power. Well, checking out here the timeline on Zwift, you can see certainly after the warm up, we started the effort. ERG was engaged 
um, targeting 315 watts, but definitely there is a ramp of power there. And obviously Tom prescribed as even as possible. So I may have to redo the test, but um, we'll check out what the average power was over the 12 minutes and the final four minutes. And then um, once I've got ready for work and done a little bit of work, I'll explain um, how to use um, the last four minutes of power to set the 11 different power zones. Well, I've got the training peaks data up on the screen and you can see I've highlighted the final four minutes of the test, 325 watts. So that's pretty good for me at the back end of the 12 minutes. But as I say, there was a ramp throughout and you can see that when we look here at the 12 minute power, 317 watts. So found, 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 that's very good um, 10, 12 minute power for me. So clearly um, the Romanian deadlifts didn't interfere with the cycling. So thanks very much for reminding me of the value of that movement. 10 minute power, again, very good for me, 320 watts. And then we get down to the five minute power, 324 watts. So definitely you can see how there was a negative ramp throughout. So I reckon that the four minute power in order to assess the 11 different power zones will lie somewhere between 317 and 325 watts. Now I need to crack on with work, um, but when I've got a moment, I'll report back and talk a little bit about how to use that four minute power in order to set Tom's power zones. Well, the hair is a little bit longer, you can see, because work and family has taken priority the last 10 days or so, so it's taken a while to calculate the 11 power zones from the test, but the results are in. Average power for the test you'll see on the screen was 317 watts for the 12 minutes. I was using erg mode as I touched on during the test. And in the final four minutes, the average power was 325 watts. And that's okay, a bit of a ramp of power, even though I was using erg mode. But Tom Danielson is saying, so long as the final four minutes is no more than 10 watts greater than the average for the whole test, that's okay. So as a result of that, I've plugged into a spreadsheet the percentages by which you either reduce or increase that final four minutes of power. And you can see there on the spreadsheet, we go from the base zone one, right the way through to max explosive in zone 11. And having digested the data in a table, I reckon this is a pretty good starting place for me personally, in terms of the power for each of the zones and the duration I ought to be able to sustain that power for definitely based on some of the tests I've done outside, for example, the hour of the power, the two hours of tempo, this kind of thing, and obviously some of the indoor training as well. Now it starts in terms of the first four power zones, very much endurance focus. What would probably equate to zone two stroke lower zone three in old money terms, as it were. And very much in those endurance, those first four endurance power zones, fat is the primary source of fuel to power the effort. But then we move on to power zone five, and this is a gold standard power zone for Tom Danielson. It's a critical power zone to ride at and train in and indeed race in because both fat and glycogen are used to fuel the effort. Whereas once you go past power zone five, it's very much glycogen that is fueling the effort and you have limited stores of glycogen. And so being mindful of when you're using fat as the energy source, versus fat and glycogen as the energy source versus predominantly glycogen is critical to be a, being able to ride more strategically and deploy your kind of mid to upper threshold or indeed VO2 max here, nuclear long surge power more strategically in order to deploy your resources to best effect. So as you can see, there were three power zones in threshold five the gold standard, six and seven, and definitely power zone six, mid threshold, looks about right for me in terms of what I would sustain as a typical threshold effort on a 20 minute climb in a swift race or outdoor or something like that during a test. Then we hit nuclear, which is very much VO2 max in nature, as is in all honesty, high threshold power zone seven, but nuclear power zone eight is definitely a three to five minute effort, VO2 max to the max, burning all the matches, and that's definitely about right for me, um, based on predominantly Zwift racing, but also things like the Gorby, that kind of thing. Then we have the long surge in power zone nine in the short surge, one to two minutes for the long surge, 60 seconds to 30 seconds for the short surge, and then it's power zone 11, max explosive, very muscular in nature, empty the tank, and as I say, Power zones six through 11 are predominantly using glycogen as a fuel source, obviously a bit of ATP there as well in power zones nine, 10 and 11. 
Now I find the 11 power zones and the concept of being very mindful of which zone you're going to be using and when very alluring because it accords with my experience on the Zwift racing, the outdoor crits and definitely the climbing races um, on Zwift. And Tom is a big advocate of power zone 5, i.e. lower threshold, because at that power zone, as I say, you're using both fat and glycogen to fuel the effort, but also you're able to clear the lactate very efficiently. And that means you can cover surges, i.e. someone attacks, you can go into power zone 9 for a 1 to 2 minute surge, or 10 for a 30 second to 60 second surge, cover the attack, and then recover back in power zone five by a lower threshold and get back to clearing the lactate. And some of the training I've done recently does exactly that. So definitely it accords with my own experience of Zwift racing and good training to prepare for Zwift racing. Um, and also the concept of using both fat and glycogen and therefore sparing a bit more glycogen by not straying into the upper threshold and mid threshold zones is also um, a nice, kind of tool to have at mind in order to conserve kind of resources for when they're needed most. Now integral to Tom's training methodology is being very mindful about the power zone you're looking to target at any given point in the ride and being very precise and accurate about not going above a particular ceiling for that particular power zone or below a floor because then you can be very deliberate in terms of transitioning from one power zone to the next and you can make conscious decisions as to which energy source you're going to use to fuel the next effort, i.e. fat versus fat and glycogen versus just glycogen, but also you can become very strategic about how and when to deploy the different power zones in order to play to your personal strengths, or to make maximum use of momentum across varying terrain, or to react to different circumstances in a race, or indeed better still to dictate the circumstances in that particular race. And generally, when allied to better cadence, body position and nutrition become overall a much better cyclist. I'm very much looking forward to exploring the concepts in Tom's book, not just the power zones, but also the cycling technique, either cadence and body position, mindset, nutrition and also some of the training plans but starting with the power zones I'm going to incorporate that into my Zwift racing and also my training plus I'm going to use this concept on some of the sportives and all of the sportives I've got planned over late May and the early summer starting with the struggle dales where the intent is to ride the climbs at lower threshold i.e. 260 watts obviously as they get steeper I'll be into threshold and high threshold at times in order to do that, burning into the glycogen and then on the descents it's going to be power zone one or freewheeling I guess and where there is flat because it is after all Yorkshire I'll be trying to ride in those endurance zones, I zones two, three and four in order to use fat as a source of fuel, conserve glycogen and hopefully get my best possible time while having a bit of fun with everybody as well. Looking forward to it. Now in the comments section, found, 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 FFF, thank you very much for the comments, confirms that the Romanian deadlift that I'm about to demonstrate is an excellent move for the cyclist. This is because cycling is a quad dominant sport and therefore in the gym for the lower body exercise you want to focus on movements that really emphasise the posterior chain, i.e. the back, the glutes, the hamstrings and also the core. Now FFF very much likes the deadlifts I've been doing because they do exactly that. However, the conventional deadlift and also the trap bar deadlift, um, they're great movements, but they put a bit more stress on the central nervous system than the Romanian deadlift. Also, the trap bar deadlift, as I've said in the past, as well as working the posterior chain, also works the quads a bit as well. Therefore, FFF says to avoid overly fatiguing the muscles and the nervous system, try subbing out the trap bar deadlifts for a little while with the Romanian deadlift. And if you do that, it'll mean that you're better able to have a nice hard cycling training after all. We'll see about that in a little bit. Therefore, gonna demonstrate that now. Now, the emphasis on the movement is on setting up with a nice straight upright back, chest up, shoulders back, and trying to lock out um, the back and the lats. And then as we descend down, the focus is on trying to keep the chest up and the back nice and straight and locked out. And in terms of range of motion, you only want to go so far as um, the back is able to remain straight. You want to stop the range of motion before the back starts to round. Then on the movement up, we're squeezing the glutes and the hamstrings hard and trying to push through with the hips to finalise the movement. Here we go.
Well, they felt good, 10 reps there, and you'll see I stopped the movement just after the 10th rep because the bar speed started to slow. And I wanted to keep the movement nice and powerful um, to avoid um, really any chance of delayed onset muscle soreness. Also, throughout the movement, keeping the knees out over the toes and also the bar very close to the body. It's dragging it up the legs and keeping it very close to the hips at the end of the movement. Felt really nice. Thank you very much for the tip, FFF. And if you don't have access to a barbell, well, fear not. You can use the dumbbells instead to execute the remaining deadlift. And I personally almost prefer the RDL using the dumbbells because there's a slightly better mind-muscle connection. Now there is one small difference using the dumbbells for the RDL and that's that you have to rotate the dumbbell throughout the movement, which is why I'm going to demonstrate it from a slightly different angle right now. That movement feels really nice. Dumbbells, probably grip becomes a limiting factor a bit faster than the barbell where it's easier to kind of wrap the fingers right around the bar. 